and everyone can be seated. Dr. Solomon, before you were talking about um, psychotic features, delusions and hallucinations don't always have to be present. Are there other characteristics of psychotic thinking? Yes. What are those? There are several. One is disorganized thinking, and that is where a person just doesn't think like a, like a normal person, like you and I usually think. They uh, might switch from one topic to another. They might uh, answer a question in a way that it's uh, not a direct answer. It's kind of tangential. Um, they also sometimes will have disorganized motor behavior. And um, it's, it's kind of abnormal way of, of, of moving where they have, uh, they might stare at, at, at somebody, and that was in the records. I saw that a few times where uh, she'll be talking, she would be talking to one of the experts, for example, and just, just have a fixed stare. Uh, that's just another example. Could that also be, when you're talking about a fixed stare, could that also be um, qualified as intense eye contact? There, there's a difference, okay. and, and you can, if you if you witness it, you, you can tell that there's a difference. When um, when someone um, has those characteristics, are you you were saying abnormal movement? Right. Okay. Is there anything about abnormal movement other than the? The intense eye, the staring. Yes, yeah, sometimes a person will just go mute. They can't. They they'll be in the middle of a conversation with you, and then they just stop, and they're just sitting there staring. Um, they may not be staring at the per other at another person. Maybe just be staring out into space. Or they sometimes they just look like they're in a stupor, like you know. And then another thing is uh, so, there's some negative symptoms that we should mention. Uh, what are, what are negative symptoms? Um, things maybe that people are not doing, like uh, someone who is in a psychotic state or has psychotic features uh, may not be able to experience pleasure from uh, th positive things in life. Uh, they may not be uh, interested in social interactions. They can't get close to other people. Uh, now, now, in the records, there's been some indication about feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. D does that refer to those items, the negative um, aspects, or is that different? It's, it's on a continuum. Uh, anyone who's depressed, severely depressed, might feel helpless, might feel hopeless, stuck in the depression. Uh, but if you add the psychotic feature, it's even more intense. And it may be to the point where they just can't do anything. They're, you know, even things that they would like to get up and do, like make themselves dinner, they may not be able to do that. Now, sometimes, uh, as a general public, we have the perception of someone being psychotic, you know, yelling at a street corner at, at nobody or, or things of that nature. Is that always the way that disorganized thoughts or psychosis would present itself? Well, I think that's a, that's a really good question because I think that's the way uh, many of us think about somebody who's psychotic is that they're totally out of control and they're maybe homeless or uh, people who are um, either raging or uh, catatonic uh, in an institution. But those are the, a very few, a very small percentage of the most severe psychotic people. Um, most 
forms of psychosis are not that severe. And people who are psychotic or who go in and out of psychotic thinking either way, they are regular people. A lot of them uh, function, they hold jobs. Uh, I, I worked once with a licensed mental health counselor who did a very good job, and I didn't know he was psychotic until I had worked with him for a while, and he told me he was on antipsychotic medication. So uh, psych people who are psychotic drive cars, they hold jobs, uh, they have families, uh, they, they sometimes may have periods when they can't function but sometimes they can. Now, as far as psychosis or psychotic thinking, is it always a, a situation where, where someone begins psychotic thinking, it's continuous until a period where it ends? Or is it fluid? Does it fluctuate? It fluctuates. Somebody with, uh, who is bipolar with psychotic features could be perfectly normal for a period of time and then have a psychotic episode. Just like they can have a depressive episode and get very depressed, or they could have a manic episode and uh, feel very energetic and, and high uh, energy, high energy. When you're treating somebody as far as the, if they're in a depressed episode or a manic episode, is it, is it as distinctive to be able to say, okay, on Thursday, this is when the manic episode started, and on Saturday is when it ended, or is it something that's more of a continuum? It's usually more of a continuum where somebody will go downhill slowly and they'll, they'll be more uh, more depressed and then get to a point perhaps where they can't get out of bed. But sometimes it can be more sudden. And there's, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop. There. When someone is in a severe depressed state, are they able to just kind of what we would call snap out of it and then from one day to the next, they're fine, or does it take some time to get out of a severe depressed state? Typically, it would take a lot of time. Okay. Are there episodes called mixed states? Yes, there Ex are. Explain mixed states to a jury. Well, some people, some people refer to that as just sort of an in-between state where somebody's not real depressed or real high, they're just kind of in-between. Is it possible to have aspects of depression and mania or hypomania at the same time? I think, are, are you asking me about rapid cycling? Well, I'm asking you, is it possible to have aspects of depression as well as aspects of either hypomania or mania. I think that's particularly true in what we call rapid cycling where someone could have, and in fact, Ms. Scheniker told me at times when she was in the jail that she had rapid cycling and she would be in a depressed, maybe she'd be in a, in a up mood when she got up in the morning and then she'd get very depressed in a couple hours, and then a few hours later, she would be manic again, or feel more high, and then again depressed. So it could happen uh, like two or four changes, let's say four changes in a day with her, and in other people, rapid cycling uh, could happen four changes in a week or a month. Is rapid cycling something that you also observed in the records of Ms. Schoeniker? Yes, they, that was in the jail records, in the medical records. When we were talking before about psychotic features and your diagnosis of Ms. Schoeniker, um, I believe we were talking before about Walter Reed. Is, is Walter Reed also the National Institute of Health? Uh, it's gone back and forth, and I think the National Institute of Mental Health is a different agency, but I think that uh, they at times use Walter Reed Hospital as, uh, as a hospital. Okay. And how, 
how long was Ms. Schoeniker in the National, in, in the Walter Reed Hospital? She was in the hospital for nine months. Um, she was supposed to be in, I think, for a lesser period of time, but she got so depressed that they kept her longer after the study. Okay. And when, can you explain to the jury the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? Yes. Um, a psychologist has a PhD in um, psychology, and the clinical psychologist has that degree in clinical psychology. We're trained how to do therapy or treatment with people and how to evaluate people. Um, psychiatrists uh, deal with medication. They're MDs, and they deal with, uh, they, they also can do therapy. But most psychiatrists today uh, do uh, prescribe medication. They evaluate the person and then decide, how can I help this person who's having psychotic symptoms uh, feel better? And so they can prescribe antipsychotic medication or antidepressants. As part of things. what you do with meeting with patients, do you prescribe medication? No, I do not prescribe medication. Okay. Were you made aware just by the records of the medication that Ms. Schoeniker was on at different times during her treatment? Yes, many notes in the records talk about medication. Okay. When you determined that your independent um, evaluation of Ms. Schoeniker would lead you to believe that she should, that the, it was the appropriate diagnosis, bipolar one with psychotic features. Can you tell me from the records what you observed about prior times when Ms. Schoeniker exhibited psychotic features or psychotic episodes? Okay, are you, you're not asking me about medication, you're asking me about her behavior. Yes, I'm asking about what you discern from the records regarding her prior times when she exhibited psychotic thinking or psychotic features. Okay, I want to just refresh my memory for just a moment. Okay, when she was uh, in the National Institute of Health study, uh, they noted in the medical record that she had a fixed false belief, that's the quote, uh, that she had a tumor in her brain and that the tumor was causing her, uh, d her depression. And that a fixed belief means it wasn't just a, th a thought that she uh, asked the doctor about. She believed that despite the fact that there was no evidence to support that. That would be one example. Now, when she was in Walter Reed, did they actually do a scan of her brain during yes, they, that time? Yes, they did. Okay. And that was the belief that she expressed at that time was during that nine-month period where she was in the National, in Walter Reed? I believe so. Okay. Were there other times from the records that you discerned that there was psychotic thinking? Very much so. Um, also, uh, during that same period, no, this was a later period, I'm sorry. She was also seen by the, um, the same <coughs> hospital um, in 2007. And when it, you say the same hospital, you're referring to Walter well, Reed by the as National well? Me uh, Medical, uh, by the National Military Medical Hospital. Okay. Yes, she wa was also seen there by those folks uh, in 2007. And she, they noted in their medical records that she had a psychotic experiencing, experience watching images from the television set. So that would have probably been uh, noted as a hallucination. Now that would have been what you were describing earlier, an auditory hallucination or a visual hallucination? It could have been both or okay. either. Okay. And then they, um, at USF, when she was at USF uh, Psychiatry um, Clinic, they noted that in the medical records that she had uh, 
when she wasn't on her medication, she had paranoid ideations that she feels that her 13-year-old daughter is bipolar as well, and there was no reason to believe that, but that was a, a delusional thinking that she experienced. That was in 2007, uh, later in 2007. Were and there any other times um, at USF where she exhibited psychotic thinking or psychotic features? Yes, the medical record notes in 2009, now this is later, that she had a, she discussed with her, um, I think it was the psychiatrist, a bizarre desire, and this is in quotes, to get pregnant and give a, the baby up for adoption. Now she was um, 49 years old, I think, at the time. And that con continued for several months, so that was another example of delusional thinking. Now, when you say that continued for several months, are you, what are you referring to? The medical record, in, in quotes, says, bizarre thoughts continued for several months until 10-26-09, unquote. That's from the USF medical record. And then, uh, Another statement, now this is in July 6, 2009, so this is later, Sir, no, I'm sorry, this is earlier, no, this is later. From the first one I said was February 11th, this is July 6th. Okay. Another medical note in the record states at USF, Patient states she thought a lot about wanting to take from her psychiatrist a comb and using the DNA from that to impregnate herself with the psychiatrist's child. And then in parentheses it says patient states that the psychiatrist was trying to save her. So that's another example of a delusional Judge belief. Me, so that's a delusion. When you went and spoke to Ms. Scheneker and did your evaluations, did you talk to her about her family history? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you talk to her about her illness, her depression, and her yes. bipolar, and how that affected her? Yes, of course. Did you also talk to her about um, the incident, the shooting? Yes, I did. Okay. When you make a decision about sanity or insanity, what do you take into consideration in formulating, in general, what do you take into consideration in formulating your opinion? Past medical records, the results of my interview with the person, my interviews with the person, uh, the results of psychological testing, the results of other um, individuals who have contact with the person. For example, in this case, I looked at a lot of emails that went back and forth among the family, including by her husband, Parker. 
I looked at her writings. Uh, she wrote a um, very important uh, letter to her daughter, Calix, describing her illness uh, about, I guess it was maybe a year and a half before the shootings. Okay. Um, so a lot of information goes into such a decision. Uh, the, one of the most important sources of data, though, is my interviews with her, and there were several uh, examples of psychotic thinking in my interviews with her. So along with your review of records, did you personally observe times when Ms. Scheneker exhibited psychotic thinking? Yes, I did. Okay. I did. Tell me about those times, or tell the jury about those times. Okay. Uh, the first time I saw her in the jail, which would have been my second interview with her, was on February 9th, 2011. She was crying, and she was very upset, and she said to me that the funeral had taken place for the children the day before. And she told me that she had asked her psychiatrist if she could go to the funeral. And the psychiatrist said to her, well, how would you get there? And she said, well, I would just go to the airport and buy a plane ticket, and I would go. And um, <clears throat> then the psychiatrist said to her, well, no one at the funeral would want to see you, would want you to be there. And she said she did, couldn't understand why that would be. And then after we talked about it a few minutes, she said, well, I could have colored my hair and uh, my hair differently, and I could have sat in the back, and people wouldn't have recognized me. And she was very upset that she wasn't able to be at the funeral. Were there any other times that she exhibited to you during your interviews with her psychotic thinking? Yes, several times when I talked to her at the jail, different times, she said that she wanted to go home and get her computer because she had to have a way to pay her bills. That was, that was another example. Another example was in my fourth interview, which was on March 4th, 2011. Uh, she told me that she had heard a helicopter during the night, and she thought that the SWAT team was coming to take her out of the jail. And she s said she told her psychiatrist about that. And indeed, it is in the jail medical records. That, and she believed that. And she thought they were going to come back. The SWAT team was going to come back and take her out of the jail in their helicopters. Were um, there any other times when she exhibited psychotic thinking while you interviewed her at the jail? OK, well, I think I already mentioned that she thought that because she had been sexually abused as a child, uh, she, had, she thought that Bo, her son, would also be sexually abused. And she worried a lot about that. And that was part of the delusional thinking that went into her final plan to kill the children. What did she tell you about um, her history with sexual abuse? She told me that she was molested by a neighbor several times when she was about seven years old, and that several other children in the neighborhood had been molested by him. Uh, he lived about a block away, and he had a garage where he, I guess he left it open, and he would sit there and make furniture for little girls' dollhouses. And um, the kids would love to go in and see the furniture. And once in a while, he would give each of them a, a little piece of dollhouse furniture. And he would have them sit on his lap. And he would put his hand up their underwear and their pants and their underwear and molest them. And uh, apparently, that happened uh, several times. And at one point, she, um, Julie Scheneker, as the little girl was sitting on the floor playing with her younger sister. And her mother overheard her asking her sister whether that had happened to her, too. And her mother jumped into action and 
called the police and reported it, and the man was put on trial, or he, there was a court proceeding, I don't know if it was a trial, and uh, it ended up, and she was very upset about this, that he was uh, apparently found guilty and he was given a card that he had to keep with him saying he was a, a child molester, but he never went to jail or anything. Did she tell you that she testified during that proceeding? She did testify during that trial, and apparently it was a very traumatic thing. Some of the other, uh, I guess a couple of other children also testified, but some of the mothers didn't want their children to have to testify and, and wouldn't get involved in it. Um, also, I think it's important to note that uh, that that sexual abuse episode uh, really affected her. All her life it affected her. She told me that the man had a beard and that people with beards would uh, trigger her and she would think about it and that she always was very careful after that and she, that's why she worried a lot about her own children being molested. Okay. When you um, were able to speak to Ms. Schenecker about the events leading up to the shooting. What ended up being your ultimate opinion regarding Ms. Schenecker's sanity or insanity at the time of the shooting? I think without a doubt that she was insane at the time of the shooting and at, dur during the week the f prior to the shooting. And how did you come to that opinion? Well, first of <laughs> all, I, I need to just preface this by saying that sane people don't shoot and kill their children. They don't kill their children. Even psychopaths don't kill their own children. They may kill other people's children. They don't kill their own children because there's, we are genetically programmed to protect our children. And someone has to be very, very mentally ill for the biochemistry of the brain that's off balance to override the genetic programming. What did Ms. Schenecker tell you about the events leading up to the shooting that assisted you or enabled you to come to that opinion? Okay, well, first of all, she told me many times that she has always wanted to kill herself since she, since she was 12 years old. And I imagine that she had some depression at that time. But she's always, she had always thought about killing herself. But she was very, actually very happy about having children. She wanted children. Um, and when her children were young, she had a period where she was not, uh, she was not extremely depressed or extremely manic during a period of time. Part of that could have been hormonal. Sometimes that, that helps. But now there, when she was talking about <coughs> raising her children when she was young, did you talk to her about how her depression was during that time? Right. She said she was much less depressed. There was a period when she said she was not depressed when she was pregnant and when she was having, when she first had her children. But then slowly she became to have, she came to have periods of depression. They weren't as bad then. Um, she loved being a mother. And in fact, her husband Parker stated in the record that she was a good mother. And her mother-in-law, Nancy Schenecker, stated in the record, she was a good mother. Now, when Ms. Schenecker ended up going to the Walter Reed Hospital for nine months, at that time, had she already had her children? Yes, they were young. Okay. And at that time, she was beginning to get depressed again. It's important to remember that there can be an overall downward trend, which I think happened in this case, and, but there's also ups and downs and middle ground. So uh, she wasn't always depressed. Those were episodes. Is that unusual for someone who has been diagnosed with bipolar one? 
to have ups and downs and sometimes no, that's, middle road? that's the that's what the disorder is all about. That's why it's called bipolar, because you go up and you go down. Now, when she talked to you about the events leading up to the shootings, what did she convey to you that led you to ultimately have an opinion that she was insane at that time? She said that she woke up the Saturday morning before the shooting and she had a clear thought, that's a quote, a clear thought. So she had been before that for a long period of time, several weeks, she had been so depressed she couldn't get out of bed. But she got up that morning, she was less depressed for that day at least, and she said she had a clear thought that she could kill herself that day. And the reason was because she thought that she could shoot her children and then shoot herself, and the three of them could go to heaven together and be with God, and they would all be safer and have a nicer life. And that would save her children from all those things that she was so afraid was going to happen to them. They wouldn't be molested. They wouldn't have mental illness. They wouldn't, uh, she was worried because Bo wanted to be a uh, professional soccer player and she didn't think he was good enough. He was going to be disappointed in life. So she had a whole list of things why it would be better for them to go to heaven with her because then she wouldn't be leaving them with the legacy of a mother who killed herself. That, that kept her. That thought prevented her from killing herself earlier. She did have two prior suicidal att suicide attempts, uh, but it, all in all, she didn't really want to kill herself and leave the kids without a mother and with that legacy. Now, when you observe the records and you talk to Ms. Scheneker about the events leading up to the shooting, was there a time when she was in a deep depression leading up to that January 27th? Yes. Okay. She was in a deep depression for several weeks. That's been documented many times. Okay. And did you take into consideration the the incident that she had with Calix where she slapped Calix in the face and then she has the car accident leading into the rehab? Yes. What can you tell the jury about that time frame leading up to the depression? Okay. I think it's critically important to note, critically important. She had been on antipsychotic <clears throat> medication most of the time for about a 10-year period, and different ones were tried. Um, in June of 2010, that's the June before the shooting, she was being seen at USF uh, Psychiatry Center, and she was on uh, an antipsychotic med medication and it called Abilify. And she took herself off of that suddenly uh, because she was starting to have symptoms of a condition called tardive dyskinesia. Now, is tardive dyskinesia a condition that you're familiar with? Yes. Okay. Have you seen that before in patients that you've treated? Yes, many times. And how does tardive dyskinesia affect somebody physically? Tardive dyskinesia is a side effect that happens from some antipsychotic medication in some people, particularly if they've been taking it a long time. And what happens is they begin to have involuntary movements around the mouth, uh, like they'll, the, the jaw will move funny or they thrust their tongue. Uh, so that they look kind of odd when you're looking at them because they have these, they can't control these movements. It also can result in leg thrusts at night, which interferes with sleeping. They uh, sometimes have other types of motor symptoms. For example, sometimes they'll walk in a way that uh, reminds 
view of how someone with Parkinson's might might walk. So they're involuntary motor movements. Now at the time when you saw Ms. Scheneker and, and would evaluate her at the hospital and then in the infirmary at the jail, did you observe symptoms of tardive dyskinesia during that time? Okay. I did not at first, but she had taken herself off the antipsychotic and had been off it for um, several, well, from June till January. Um, so no, I did not actually notice those movements for a while, but the jail put her right back on antipsychotic medication, and she was on that for, uh, I think, about eight months in the jail, and then she started having uh, more symptoms of tardive dyskinesia, even though it was a different antipsychotic drug. So that June time frame when you're talking about discontinuing the um, antipsychotics, what is your opinion of that leading up to the other events that were happening in the fall of 2010? Okay, well, when she told her psychiatrist and her therapist at USF that she took herself off of the Abilify, the antipsychotic medication, the psychiatrist said to her, "Don't you can't just go off of that, and if you go off of the antipsychotic medication, you're going to start having delusional thinking. And so he tried to get her to taper off of it. I'm not sure what happened there, but at any rate, she got off of it. And from then on, there was a downward decline, and that was noted by several people, including by her husband, that's in, in documented, that he noticed that, she noticed that. Um, and during that period of time, her relationship with her teenage daughter started to really deteriorate and got really bad and led up to the event that you just mentioned where she slapped her daughter and the daughter told her therapist what happened and the therapist called uh, uh, DCF and they, or the police and they came out and questioned uh, Ms. Scheneker and the daughter. <clears throat> what is your opinion of how Ms. Scheneker was doing at the time of January 2011 leading up to the shootings? Well, she had been in bed for a period of, mostly in bed, for a period of at least seven weeks. She had been uh, in bad shape. In November, she had a car accident. She went into Winmore uh, Hospital in Clearwater, which is a rehab hospital, uh, because she had been drinking and drugging, because she was in such bad shape. She, ha she wasn't taking the proper medication because she had got off the antipsychotic. She was feeling terribly. She was self-medicating. She uh, was in a car accident. Uh, she was driving alone and no one was hurt in the accident, but the car was damaged. And her husband insisted that she then go into rehab, which she did. And she was in rehab for a few weeks. And then when she came out of rehab, she was again very depressed. And during the time that she was, um, I think it was during the time that she was feeling so very depressed before she went into the hospital, I think she had called her mother-in-law, who often came to help out when she wasn't doing well. And her mother-in-law came and was in the house. And then when she got out of Winmore, she went home and she went to bed and she didn't get out of bed very much for quite a while. Now after that, that December time frame when she's in bed after getting out of Winmore and then her husband leaves um, and, and goes to his deployment, what can you tell me about that Saturday leading up to the purchase of the firearm? Um, up to the shootings. Okay, well, before her husband left for his deployment, it was like a 10-day deployment, uh, she had been, according to what she told me and other people have said, uh, she had been mostly in bed and had not been doing a lot in the way of carpooling or fixing dinner or things like that. Um, 
Then when he left, her husband left, she had to suddenly function more and do more on the carpooling and, and childcare. So she tried to do that and it was really hard for her to get out of bed. I think, well, what did she? What did she tell you about that time frame when she had to get out of bed and she was starting to um, help out with the children when her husband left the country? That she was severely depressed. It was very hard for her to get into a shower, and that's a, a, a common symptom of serious depression when you can't even get into the shower you feel so bad so she had trouble she said that she even drove the carpool a couple times i guess in her uh pajamas in a robe so she was struggling at that point and then saturday morning she woke up with that thought of escape from this way she was feeling and is that what you're saying? What did she tell you, you about, did, did she talk to you about s suicide or thoughts of suicide in the past? Yes, she talked a lot about that all her life she wanted to commit suicide, but she wouldn't do it because of the children. And then that morning she got up with this thought, well, if I take them with me to heaven, then I can do it. I can finally kill myself. When That is psychotic thinking. What can you tell me about her thought process after purchasing the firearm and leading up to the Thursday? Okay. She was disappointed that she didn't get the firearm right away. She didn't know that there was a waiting period. So she through the through that those three or four days waiting period, she was I think uh, drinking again and taking uh, drugs that had been prescribed for her. She always took prescription drugs. She never took, by her account, never did street drugs. Uh, she had some prescription drugs uh, like oxycodone, and she was taking those during that week. And her, she said to me that her mind was very scrambled, and that's when she wrote some very strange messages, uh, which um, I think some people have referred to as her journal. But she wrote a lot of little uh, scraps of things. The writings that she did, the journal, was that something that you were provided and you reviewed? Yes. Okay. And the statement that she gave to law enforcement, the recorded statement, is that something that you also reviewed? Yes. Now, did you take those things into consideration for your ultimate opinion in the case? Yes, I did. And one of the things she said to law enforcement, well, when I think it was when they got to her, when she was talking to them at the house, um, she said, are my children coming in? And I heard her say that to me several times in the jail. She wasn't convinced that her children were dead. And um, so she, she had, I think that's another example of psychotic thinking, that she wasn't clear that they were really dead. Did that fluctuate? Were there moments when she realized that they were dead and then moments where she thought that they were still alive? Yes, that did fluctuate. Is that something that you observe from the police reports and the statements as well as your interaction yes. with her? Yes. Tell me about your opinion as far as whether she knew what she was doing at the time was right or wrong. Okay. She told me that she never even thought about whether it was legal or illegal or whether it was right or wrong. She was totally focused on her plan, which would have taken her children and her to God, to heaven, and they would have a better life. Um, 
and and she said that when I asked her. I said, did you know? Well, did you know that it wasn't legal, or you know, what were you thinking about that? And she said, I never even thought about it. Now, someone going purchasing a firearm, waiting the time period, going and picking up the firearm and then going and, and shooting her children as Ms. Schenecker did in this case. Would you agree that at that time the actions that she exhibited, she was determined to shoot herself and shoot the children? Uh, from the, okay, when she went to get the firearm, I believe she, that was in her mind during that week. I think she was in a psychotic, drug-induced haze. I mean, that's plus. Psychotic plus she was doing alcohol and drugs. So I, I don't think she had, could think clearly at all during that time. However, I want to again say, and I think you were asking me this, that um, even though she was very psychotic at the time, she could look normal. When she was in that gun shop, shop she looked normal. There's video showing that she talked normally. She, she was on automatic pilot, and as I said earlier, psychotic people know how to behave. They, they know how the world works. And so at least part of the time, they can talk normally and uh, protect themselves in, in ways and... Now, when someone is psychotic and you say they can appear normally, mm -hmm. does that mean that what's going on in their mind is focused or is uh, logical? No, they could be on automatic pilot and know how to behave because we learn that from the time we're kids. You know, it's automatic for people to say thank you because you learn when you're five years old or three or four or five, you learn that you're supposed to say please and thank you. And so you can be extremely mentally ill and still say thank you when somebody does something for you. And now, it's now the when, same thing. When someone is psychotic but is intelligent as Ms. Schenecker is, is that diminish her intelligence level when she becomes psychotic? Does she become less intelligent? Okay, that's a very complicated question, but no. The answer to is really no, that she was on automatic pilot, and because she is intelligent, she was able to automatically uh, respond. And also, she has great social skills because she spent 20 years being the wife of a military officer, <coughs> colonel in the military, and she had to know how to uh, be a appropriate socially, and she would rise to those occasions. Even sometimes when she was very depressed, she would be able to force herself to function. Now, at the time of the shootings, on January 27, 2011. What is your opinion about her mindset at that time of the actual shootings? I think she was in a psychotic state. Again, people who are not psychotic do not kill their children. She was in a psychotic state. Uh, there were some things some examples, for example, I'll give you one quick example. Um, when she was walking, she had the gun in her purse, she's walking to the car with Bo to take him to soccer practice. She sees his dirty uniforms on the washer as she walks past, and she makes a mental note, I'll have to do his laundry uh, on Saturday, or before Saturday, because he has a big game on Saturday. So I, I need to be sure I, I, I do his laundry. Now here's the woman that's about to kill him, and she's, her mind is, it, it doesn't make sense. She's psychotic. Do you have any opinion about her covering the children or putting blankets on them after the shooting? That's another example of psychotic behavior. Um, 
Yes, she put <coughs> blankets on them. She checked on them several times. Um, she talked to them. Um, she, that's, to me, that's, that's all part of being in a psychotic confusion. What did she tell you about her plans for after she shot the children, what she had hoped would happen? She intended to kill herself. That was clear from the beginning, and it's in her notes, and it's in an email, and it's something that she had, people knew that she, well, she had made two other suicide attempts. People knew that she was suicidal. What did she tell you about why, why that didn't happen? Well, she had the pl she had a, a three part plan to kill herself. She wanted to uh, use carbon monoxide poisoning. She wanted to, she was going to sit in the car for that part, and then she wanted to overdose, and then she was going to shoot herself. And from the records, uh, I learned that after she shot the children, she went into her bathroom, and she reloaded the gun and she intended to shoot herself but she wanted to be kind of out of it before she did. She was very worried that she might shoot herself and not die. So she wanted to be sure that she was going to do, the, do it correctly. Did she talk to you about failing at suicide when you interviewed yes, her? Yes, she apparently overdosed and fell asleep from the overdose and didn't wake up till the next morning, and then she was um, toxic from the medications she had taken, and she was very foggy and uh, physically shaky. And she said she was very angry at herself because she failed, and that's what she said. That she said, "I failed again. I'm a failure." She was very upset that she didn't kill herself. She didn't succeed in killing herself. If I could have one moment. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, if I understood your testimony correctly, you indicated that the time period between when the defendant bought the gun and when she shot her children, she was insane. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And do you remember giving a different answer in a deposition? I said that I had not completely come to my final decision at that time. I think I made it very clear in the depositions uh, that I thought she didn't know right from wrong and that she was in a psychotic state. Okay. Isn't it true that when I asked you the, the question about that time period, you said, I have no idea? I'm, I, I think I qualified that, sir. You what did I say after that? <clears throat> you indicated that you don't know. Oh, that was she was drinking more, that week. I said a lot more than that, and I read a lot more documents since then. And when was she in the, the NIH facility? Uh, I think it was in uh, 2001, the first time when she was there for the um, when she was there for the um, study. 
Okay. Would it refresh your memory to look at your notes? Yes. And specifically Walter Reed. Oh, Walter Reed, I'm sorry. That was a little bit later. 2007. 2000, yes, 2007. That's when she was first in Walter Reed for nine months? No, okay. She was in that NIH program in 2001, as I just stated. It was from, 2000, from June 2001 until March 2002. She was in the NIH program. Okay. So that was n approximately eight years before the murders, correct? Eight to nine years late. Yes. Okay. And then the next time she was hospitalized was in November 2010 when she went to Widmore, correct? That's correct. Okay, so there are no hospitalizations between those time periods, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you indicated that one of her delusions that she had in 2009 was the desire to get pregnant, correct? And yes. give up and have a baby and give it up for adoption, correct? And that was based on the USF records, correct? Yes. And in that record, she was seen by a Dr. White, correct? Yes. Okay. And in his report, he indicated as part of the diagnosis that she was bipolar 1 disorder with psychotic features, correct? I don't have that in front of me, sir. Would it refresh your memory to look at the record? I could do that. <laughs> Give me a page. I have page 157 and 158. Probably at the bottom of the page on the right hand side. <clears throat> okay, I don't have those records with me. I have a summary of those records. Perhaps you could read to me what you're talking about. Okay. Well, specifically, the report indicates that the patient was without depressive, manic, or psychotic symptoms over the past three weeks. Is that accurate, according to those records? I, I believe what you're reading. Okay. And you indicated that she wanted to get pregnant to bring a child into the world, correct? Yes. And isn't it because she had guilty feelings about having two abortions before her two children were born? That's what's in the record. Okay. And it also indicates, this record also indicates that the defendant was drinking two to six alcohol, alcoholic beverages per day, correct? I don't recall that, but I believe what you're reading. Would you like to look at the record? I believe you. Okay. Also indicates that the defendant was ambivalent, ambivalent about alcohol use, correct? Okay. And she was not interested in stopping use of alcohol treatment at that time. Isn't that accurate? Yes. Okay. Now, you've indicated that you're a clinical psychologist, correct? That's right. So you're not a, a neuropsychologist, correct? I am not a neuropsychologist. And you're not a geneticist, correct? No, but I'm a biologist. A biologist, okay. And you're not um, board certified by the American Academy uh, of Forensic Psychology, correct? No, I have not. Okay. And chosen to do that. You have chosen not to do that. I haven't chosen to do it. Okay. And you indicated that you have evaluated many people for court. Is that accurate? That's right. And how many of those cases were for competency? Many. Can you give me a number? Well, uh, any person that I evaluate forensically, I'm doing a competency evaluation on. So. Uh, I don't I don't really know exactly 30 40 so so 30 or 40 competency evaluations you've done and how long have you been a forensic psychologist um, I'm okay I 
have been a forensic psychologist for several years, but I uh, primarily do clinical work. Okay. So you've only done about 30 to 40 competency evaluations, correct? Yes. And competency is a different issue than insanity at the time of the crime, correct? That's correct. So, and I take it you've done even less evaluations for sanity at the, or insanity at the time of a crime, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it less than 10 times? Probably around 10 times. Okay. And I take it you've never testified in court on the issue of insanity at the time of a crime before, correct? Well, actually, I was involved in a case with Mr. Pruner several years ago. Okay. Did you? Uh, in which sanity was an issue. Okay. Was that the defense in that case? I was on the state's team at that point. Was that case, um, was the defendant in that case Willie Sexton? Uh, it was Eddie Lee Sexton. Okay, Eddie Lee Sexton. Weren't you retained by the defense in that case? I was deterred, okay, I was I was, yes, I was on the defense team for Willie Sexton, but then in the murder trial, which was a first degree murder trial for um, Eddie Lee Sexton, I testified for the state. But in that case, you testified as to Willie Sexton's sanity at the time of the crime, correct? Right, it was sanity, yes. Okay, but not, you didn't testify for the state in regards to Eddie Sexton's sanity. Okay, but I, okay. Um, It was in the trial for Eddie Lee Sexton that I testified. Okay. Now you indicated that you are a, as you indicated you deal with patients, correct? Yes. So you speak to patients on a regular basis, yes. correct? Yes. So if you're speaking to patients, you have to rely on what they tell you, correct? Yes. Okay. You have to rely on your observations of the person, correct? Yes. Okay, and then you can do testing of them, correct? Right, and okay. you, I can also get collateral information. Okay, but you don't have any test that tells you exactly what a person is thinking at that time, correct? I don't think there's a test that measures that. No, there's no test that basically tells you a person's thoughts, correct? Right. Okay, and you have seen patients with alcohol addiction, correct? Oh, yes. And you've seen patients with opiate addictions, yes, correct? Yes. What, what is an opiate? An opiate is a drug that um, that binds to receptors in the body that um, normally bind chemicals made by the body. And uh, opiates are like oxycodone, for example, or morphine, okay, so or heroin. Or heroin, okay. Yes. These are very addictive drugs, correct? Yes very difficult to get off them, correct? Yes. And I take it detox uh, symptoms would be very severe, correct? I've seen people many times in detox, and yes, they are, um, they can be, cravings can be severe. Okay. Would, would a side effect of uh, detoxing off of opiates or alcohol be hallucinations? Potentially. Never, I, I haven't seen that. I have not. Okay. had patients tell me that and I haven't witnessed that okay. hallucinations in that case. Okay, but is, does the literature support that there can be hallucinations while detoxing off of opiates? Yes. So that's a potential side effect, correct? That is. Okay, and alcohol, detoxing off of alcohol can have very extreme symptoms too, yes. correct? Correct. It could affect your thinking? Correct. And I take it detoxing off of opiates can affect your thinking as well, correct? Yes. Okay. You could. And um, as a clinician, if you have somebody that's depressed or mildly depressed, um, would you immediately Baker Act them? No. 
I mean, if you had a, a patient that was exhibiting, let's say, moderate depressed feelings, would you immediately Baker Act them? No. And if you had a patient that was exhibiting vague suicidal ideas, would you immediately Baker Act them? No. Okay. And that's why she wasn't hospitalized. Okay. And that's why she wasn't hospitalized. Right. Okay. And I take it as, since you are testifying here as an expert, you want to get as much information about the defendant as possible, correct? Yes. That's why you get police reports, correct? That's right. That's why you get medical records, correct? Yes. And you get depositions, correct? Yes. Did you have a deposition of Parker Schenecker? Yes, I did. Did you have the deposition of Mr. Monaco? Of? Uh, of uh, Mr. Monaco. Uh, could you refresh my memory who that was? It's a yes or no question, ma'am. Did you have the deposition of a Mr. Monaco? I, I don't think so. Okay. Did you have the, def the deposition of a Mr. Tanzo? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you have the video of the defendant purchasing the gun at the, at the gun store? No, I have not seen that video. So you've never seen that video? No. And your basis is without, your opinion is without any without having observed that video, correct? It wouldn't change my opinion, sir. It's a yes or no I, question. Your opinion is without viewing that video? Yes. Okay. Now, you've indicated that you did several tests in this case, correct? Yes. Personality uh, assessment inventory, correct? Yes. Traumatic, what was it? It's a traumatic? Stress inventory. Okay. And you did a dissociative um, experience yes. scale? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, those tests um, basically give you an idea as to what a, how a person is behaving at the time that you do the tests, That's correct? Right. That's right. Okay. So they don't necessarily tell you what the person's memory is, correct? What the person's memory? Memory is of an, of an event. Okay. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. They don't t necessarily tell you what a person was thinking at the time that they committed a, a crime, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, basically, it just helps you, helps you diagnose a person currently, correct? And helps me form an opinion about their mental state. Their mental state at a previous time, correct? That's a complicated question. Yes or no, ma'am? Does it help you form an opinion about a person's mental state at a, yes. at a prior time? Or the, basically the illness that the person suffered at a previous time? Yes. Okay. But you still have to look at the surrounding evidence at the time of the crime in order to form your opinion, correct? Yes. You have to look at um, the interview, and you also have to consider the interviews of the defendant, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you'd also have to interview other people to help you form an opinion, correct? Yes. Okay, you never interviewed Parker Schenecker, correct? Correct. Okay. And you would have to look at her journal, correct? Yes. Okay, because those are writings at the time around the incident, correct? Right. And isn't it true that you thought that those writings were just ramblings? Yes. Okay. And you have to consider the interview that she gave to the police as well, correct? Yes. And her statements to the police? Yes. Okay. And you have to look at the, to her actions leading up to the murder, correct? Yes. Okay, including her purchasing the firearm, right? Yes. And the video, and also you should have considered the video of her purchasing the firearm, correct? Yes. Okay. And you indicated, my understanding uh, of your testing was that uh, on the personality assessment inventory, she scored high for disassociation, correct? Yes, but then when I did the DES, the dissociative experience scale, she was in the range that somebody with bipolar would be, and it wasn't high enough to follow up further. Okay, so she was in the cloak. Cl low clinical range, correct? She was in the clinical range of someone with bipolar disorder. 
She's, I'm sorry, ma'am? She it was in the clinical range of someone with bipolar disorder. Okay. <laughs> Now, the personality assessment inventory also revealed that she was elevated for alcohol and drugs, correct? Yes. For that issue. And now you've also indicated that you believe that the um, defendant's belief that her daughter was becoming bipolar was delusional, correct? Yes. And isn't it true that you want you also basically thought that that was just a um, a poor poor thinking on the part of the defendant that it was Stop, not a I'm delusion? I'm sorry. Please state. Let the me question. rephrase it. Isn't it true that you thought that that was not a delusion and was just poor thinking on the part of the defendant? I think it. If somebody says that once or twice, it would just be worry or poor thinking. But if they continue to worry about it then that might be, if they believe it, then that could also be considered delusional thinking. Okay, and you remember giving me a deposition, correct? Yes. Were you sworn to tell the truth? Yes. And I was present and the defense attorneys were present? Yes. Isn't it true that you told me at that time that you viewed, you did not view Calix, the, the defendant's view or belief that the defendant's daughter was gonna become bipolar was not delusional? That's true. At the time, that was true for me, and then I read more records and found that that was something that was ongoing, and so I changed my opinion about that. Okay, so what you're telling us is that when you came into the deposition with me, you were not prepared? No, I just, I've been getting documents since last week. You know, uh, there are a lot of documents in this case. Well, we, that interview, that deposition would occur on November 6, 2013, correct? Right. Okay. Well, that, that was, um, what, eight months ago? Didn't you already have the Tampa, Gen Tampa General Hospital's records before then? Yes, and I hadn't completed reading everything that I had. Okay, and didn't point. you already have the USF records at that time? Yes. Okay, and didn't you have the records from Winmore at that time? Yes. And did, hadn't you already completed all your interviews with the defendant at that time? Yes. And I continued reading until last night. I was still reading at 11.30 last night. Okay. And isn't it true that there were no stated delusions um, before the murders? In reference to the murders? I, I don't understand your question. Let me, pass, let me rephrase the question. No. Now, you've also indicated that it was your belief that the defendant was psychotic six months before this incident occurred, correct? Uh, six months before. I said that she has uh, bipolar one with psychotic features, which means that she goes in and out of psychotic thinking. Okay. But isn't it true that you believe that her um, psychosis was exacerbated for the six months before the murders? I believe that as she, after she went off the antipsychotic medication, that there was a downward spiral. And that's a term that uh, Mr. Schenecker himself used. And even though I didn't interview him directly, I did read his deposition and I did read uh, Randy Otto's uh, comments on his uh, interview with Mr. Schenecker. Okay. Again, um, you remember giving me a deposition on November 6, 2013? Yes. Okay. Would it refresh your memory to, to look at that deposition? I could do that, sure. Page 222. Hold on a minute, please. 
Yes, sir. Page 222, lines 19 through 25. Can you read that to yourself? Yes. Okay. So, and I asked you, when did her insanity started? And you in indicated that it was exacerbated um, during the last six months. Isn't that accurate? Yes. Okay. Because she had taken herself off her medication, correct? Yes. Okay. But she was also seeing people at USF during that period, correct? Yes. And she was seeing a psychiatrist, correct? Dr. Obregon. Dr. Obregon, correct? Yes. Is that accurate? To the best of my knowledge. Okay, and she was also seeing a, uh, a social worker, correct? I think she's a licensed mental health counselor. Okay, or a social worker? I don't think so. Okay, but still, she would have training in dealing with somebody with psychological issues? Yes. Okay, and you had those reports, correct? Yes. Okay, do you have them with you? The USF records? Uh, I think so. Um, but I, I guess I'm not understanding what you're asking me. Well, first I'm asking if you have the records. Right, I'm still on the last question. Well, you indicated in the last question that she was suffering basically exacerbated psychotic symptoms for the last six months. That it was going in and she was going in and out of yes. psychosis, correct? Yes. Okay. Psychosis meaning out of touch with reality, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's your opinion, correct? That's right. Okay. And now I'm asking, did you do you have those records with you? The USF records. Yes. Okay. I will look and see. I don't know if I have all the records or if I just have a um, summary of the records. Okay, what do you want me to look at, sir? Specifically, uh, it may be marked as page 224, the, the June 2nd, 2010 record.